Hello, everybody, and welcome to Feeling Scene, the podcast that talks about the characters in the movies, and you know what, sometimes the TV shows, that make us feel seen. Today's guest is an author and a journalist. Uh, her TED Talk, Go Ahead and Dream About the Future, uh, a wonderfully optimistic conversation has been viewed by millions, and her upcoming book that you can pre-order now is called Dreams Bigger Than Heartbreak, which is a sequel to her book, Victories Greater Than Death. There are a number of other books of hers that you can purchase, and her name is Charlie Jane Anders. I first met Charlie Jane in San Francisco as the host of Writers with Drinks, an eclectic reading series that brings writers and readers across diverse genres together in one place each month. And, you know, COVID notwithstanding, it is a wonderful tradition. And after our conversation, I will have one quick thing before I go. And because I'm a messy bitch who apparently lives for drama, that one thing is going to have to do with the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie and the way in which we view sequels to longstanding legacy properties. So let's get into it. I have a co-host with me who is one of the most creatively fascinating human beings I have ever watched speak in real time. She is a Hugo Award winner. She is a novelist. She wrote for FX's adaptation of the graphic novel series Why the Last Man. Um, you save bookstores. You host gatherings of writers. You do everything in the capacity of like writing and creativity. Charlie Jane Anders. Is that a sufficient introduction? What else did, What else can I say? What did I miss? Uh, I mean, my young adult novel, Victories Greater Than Death, just came out in paperback. And the sequel, Dreams Bigger Than Heartbreak, comes out on April 5th. Wow. Um, please buy them. I desperately need your support. Thank you. And thanks so much for having me here. This is so lovely. This is just... This is so wonderful. You're welcome. And thank you for being here. Now, okay, so Charlie Jane, it, this was this was a bit of a back and forth. I mm -hmm. we it came to you, you you gave a very quick yes, and I was like, "Oh my god, this is great." And then we got on the thread and you you had an initial answer, but then you were like, "Actually, I need to think on this a bit more." And then it was like, "I'm thinking a lot and this is really hard." It was surprisingly hard. It was actually surprisingly hard. So, you know, my plea to 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 Jordan and everybody else in, uh, at Maximum Fun was basically, can I do a TV character? And I was always, <laughs> what I realized over the course of like all of my brainstorming and soul searching and researching and like Googling at 3 a.m. and everything <laughs> is that I could easily name like 20 characters from TV shows off the top of my head who I right. feel seen by. Mm -hmm. And when I think about movie characters, it gets really hard because I felt like I wanted to pick a character who was not a cis dude, which mm -hmm. automatically like cuts out most of the iconic movie characters <laughs> yep, who've ever yep. existed. And like, you know, when I thought about female and non-binary and trans characters in movies, you know, you have like, they, they fall into certain broad categories. There's like, there's, there's a lot of movies where there's like a, a lady badass who goes around, you know, shooting people, pew, pew, pew. Mm -hmm. But her personality is basically like, I go around shooting people and, <laughs> yeah. you know, or, and then somewhat, with it, there's some overlap with this next category, which is like the deeply damaged woman who is like troubled and damaged and yes. messed up and like super just like, you know, a wreck of a human being. And sometimes mm -hmm. you can be a wreck of a human being and still go around shooting everybody and pew, pew, pew. <laughs> uh, and I don't, I, some, I love some of those characters who are like these mm -hmm. deeply damaged, messed up people, but uh, they're not aspirational characters for me. They're not people that I, that make me feel like this is who I want to see yeah. this is the reflection i want to see of myself and then mm -hmm. i feel like you know when i think about characters who are more creative or fun or you know whimsical or whatever then you're almost instantly in manic pixie dream girl territory right and, yeah you know and they're they're always like kind of young and cute and kittenish and kind of like usually an object of desire for some other character mm -hmm. and you know, and it was just like once I eliminated those three kind of broad categories, it was like suddenly really thin on the ground, really slim pickings. <laughs> and like, yeah. I was like, dang, this is making me realize. I mean, I feel like movies of the last like 30 years, let's say, have have had this mandate to appeal to this incredibly broad audience. 
yeah. the, four, the four quadrant kind of tentpole audience. And that necessarily constrains the kind of characters that we can have. And then mm -hmm. you have little kind of indie movies and art films, but those are often, you know, by dint of trying to prove how arty they are, they feature <laughs> yeah. characters who are like super challenged and damaged and, you know, super, <laughs> yeah. my life is garbage and it's just like i was really having a hard time with this and i did eventually come up with a couple of selections but it was it was tough it was surprisingly uh -huh. tough it's interesting considering like the lack of film options that you were finding and looking this and to have one of the titles that you settled on one of the characters be from a classic film work be an older work in the movie anti-mame starring Rosalind Russell as the as the titular character and so that I, I feel like that's counterintuitive but I, I I like where we're going with this yeah and okay so I I warned you and I should caution our our listeners that I yes. watched Ante, uh, the movie Auntie Mame when I was a kid when I was a little kid mm -hmm. and I loved the character of Auntie Mame and I I felt mm -hmm. I definitely like felt like she was one of the people who I was like I want to be like this when I grow up um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I even I think I even read the book that it was based on because I was like, mm. oh, this is so cool. This is such a cool character. But I have not had time to rewatch it since then. And it's entirely possible that if I went back and rewatched the movie now as an adult with like all of the, you know, the new perspectives that we've all gotten in the last several years, I would be like, oh, my mm -hmm. gosh, this is so problematic. And like, I can't watch this anymore. <laughs> uh, so there is that caveat. Yeah, yeah. Having watched it last night, really, it was the uh, boy we just loved in the we loved in the. Uh, even up till recent cinema, but especially in old cinema, a stereotypical Asian servant oh, is no. uh, uh, oh, God. Ito, oh, uh, God. Auntie Mame's Auntie Mame's uh, servant oh, Ito uh, was like, oh yeah, that's that's some bullshit right there. Oh man, I'm sorry, it, I didn't have time to rewatch it. Uh, no, 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 and and we we can acknowledge we can acknowledge that structurally this is an this is a problem epidemic to film history in Hollywood. Auntie Mame's character herself isn't, but for having the uh, the servant. She goes through a strange period at the very beginning of the movie where her entire apartment is decorated in the theme of, like, Chinese dynasties. Oh. And then repaints her entire apartment periwinkle and <laughs> has, like, an abstract painting on the wall. So that is something that exists temporarily at the beginning of the movie. But for the character of Auntie Mame herself, uh, she is... Mostly just a a a white woman uh, engaging in pursuits of white women with money, and then who don't have money. As as Auntie Mame is the story of a woman, a, a socialite in New York City who loves to entertain and who is outlandish and big. And then the depression hits, and she gets completely wiped out shortly after she has had to uh, take in her nephew uh, because her brother has suddenly died, and it is sort of uh, the story of their sort of misadventures together. But I have to say, as I was watching this at the beginning and we meet Auntie Mame hosting a party, watching it through the lens of considering you as the co-host, I was like, this is Charlie Jane hosting Writers with Drinks. This is what I'm watching right now. <laughs> that adorable little bootlegger is on his way over here with another gallon of gin. Oh, Alan, darling, I'm so glad to end. I called you yesterday. Where are you? Hello, Mame. Hello, darling. I'll be with you in just a minute. Vladimir. What on earth are you doing here? Drinking myself to death, of course. <laughs> and uh, besides, I'm your guest of honor. Oh, of course, of course. And it couldn't happen to a nicer fellow. Yeah. Like, it I felt mean, so clear. What I love about Auntie Mame, and again, I haven't had time to rewatch the movie. So, and like, I should just say that, you know, yes, it is unforgivable to have those kinds of Asian stereotypes. And unfortunately, they are in a lot of our pop culture prior to, yes. you know, basically like, not that long ago and it's it's, yeah. it's a it's a real it's a real huge and shameful problem um yeah mm -hmm. i mean the thing the reason why i decided screw it i'm just gonna say auntie mame is like one of my picks is because she is like a character that we just don't see in movies that much like mm -hmm. basically since like I don't know, it's the last like 50 years. She is. She's, yeah, she's a real golden age of Hollywood figure. Yeah. And she's like this kind of larger than life, colorful, bohemian, kind of like bon vivant character who just lives a wild artistic life 
and kind of does mm-hmm. what she wants and like says, I think she's the source of that famous quote about life is a banquet. Live, that's the message. Live. Yes, life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death now. Come on, Agnes, live. Live. Come, child. Live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And like, she's just like, you know, and she hangs out with nudists and like alternative mm-hmm. people and like, you know, weirdos and artists. And like, she's just, she surrounds herself with unusual creative people and she mm-hmm. just re- rejects convention. And, you know, especially for this movie to have been made in 1958, which was the height of yeah. American conformity and, you know, the sort of repressive social order that frankly a lot of people are seem to be trying to drag us back to right now. Um, Mm -hmm. Just the fact that they were, this movie got made and it was a huge hit and a huge success to the point where like, I guess they did a remake with Lucille Ball in the early seventies and, you know, it became kind of a phenomenon and uh, it's sort of Mm -hmm. harking back to this, you know, 1920s, 1930s period where there was a lot more bohemian, you know, creative, that's a very that's a that's a very good point in contrast. Like you have it made in this era of Dwight Eisenhower, like prefab 1950s conservatism and like the McCarthy trials going on. And yet it is set at a time when it is like p- would be pre-code era Hollywood where there is this like pansy craze present in and around in Los Angeles in the entertainment industry. And you that is a such a conflicting social context for what is happening in the the mid to late 50s and then you walk into this scene when you meet Auntie Mame and there are drag kings there are women in suits there are people reciting poetry and works of plays it was a even walking into that setting I was like wow, I'm kind of taken aback right now that this is something that's being offered to me not necessarily like, you know Auntie Mame is She's a bit silly. She's a bit frivolous. And as we hear in like a voiceover at the start of the movie, her brother, as he's writing his will, is like, stop my sister from doing anything too damn eccentric. And like, (sighs) clearly he's judging her. But the movie itself just sort of enters this place and where it's presented to us as this sort of this little cave of wonders Mm -hmm. that she lives in. And it's a place that feels like you want to be inside of it with her. Yeah. And I feel like it's been a long time since I've, again, since I've seen that kind of figure, especially someone who's not Mm -hmm. like in their twenties, she's like in her fifties or, you know, even a little older, Mm -hmm. you know, someone who's older and like, you know, supposedly a grown up being that being Mm -hmm. celebrated, that kind of like exuberant weirdness. And, you know, um, that just like, I'm going to bring together all of the misfits and all of the like outlandish artists and outsiders that I can find and just like, you know, throw them a party and hang out with them and like, you know, go around on Mm -hmm. roller skates and, you know, just like (laughs) live the most colorful, wacky life that I can. I feel like that's not a person that gets celebrated very often in our pop culture, especially not in the movies. Mm -hmm. If we had a character like Auntie Mame now, I think that she would be a problem that had to be solved in some way. Like, right. we would have to, like, get her to stop drinking or we'd have to, like, you know, <laughs> there would be some underlying no. reason why she's behaving this way that needs to be dealt with because she's clearly got some kind of issue that she's not confronting or... It would be about trauma. It would be about trauma. It would be about trauma or about trying to fix her in some way. And there would be some, you know, reason that would come in that would be why she had to be fixed. Like I said, maybe it's that, mm-hmm. you know, we decide she's, she's got a substance abuse problem or she's like, or she's behaving recklessly or, you know, just something. And like, I don't know. I mean, there was that movie recently, the prom, which I watched on Netflix where like Meryl Streep is playing right. this like over the top actress. And like Meryl, I love how Meryl Streep really enjoys like going over the top. You know, she is an amazing actress, but she also is like kind of a goofball. And she likes to just like... <laughs> She's also very extra. Yeah, she likes to take these like completely like bonkers roles and just like throw herself into them. And so in the prom, she's playing this like very over the top actress who is kind mm-hmm. of, you know, a scene stealing, you know, silly, goofy character. And her romance with, I guess it's uh, Keegan-Michael Key in the film is like, mm. is one of the best parts of that movie. But at the same time, I don't know that we're supposed to think that she's a good person or that we're supposed to like want to, to emulate her. I think that the movie is kind of gently mm-hmm. telling us she's an egomaniac. Her extraness right. is a problem. 
she needs to dial it back. Mm -hmm. There's just like that undercurrent. And, you know, again, I feel like there are some TV shows that feature sort of bohemian. Yeah, what are some, some, you know, we we definitely like, the conversation can travel. So like you're you're welcome to introduce like some some characters that you feel like, because I think it's important to to discuss where and, and what are these permissions that TV has that cinema seems to at this point be playing catch up to? Why does it feel like there is so much more sort of fruitful terrain in television kind of at this point? And it feels like the movies need to do better to make up for the ground that they've lost to, to the quote unquote small screen. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there are heroes on TV. Like, OK, I'm just going to say, for example, the 13th Doctor, the current uh, Doctor mm. in Doctor Who is that kind of like. And that's Jodie Whittaker. Is that Jodie Whittaker? Yeah, Jodie Whittaker. And the Doctor has always been this kind of, you know, frequently, not not all of the versions of the Doctor, but usually the Doctor is kind of an eccentric, kind of a yeah. whimsical character who is kind of going to whisk you off on a great adventure and show you wonders mm-hmm. and also just be kind of a a goofy, I keep using the word goofy, but I, I, I think it really applies, this kind of like somewhat <laughs> offbeat character who will who is a who behaves like they don't quite know what century they're in and like you know (laughs) and they've just picked up a bunch of like eccentric habits over the years and can't be you know bothered to change them and you know i felt like a huge leap forward that we finally got to have a woman in that role because that is the kind of that kind of like eccentric weirdo who is Mm -hmm. you know kind of celebrated or at least you know kind of appreciated for their Mm -hmm. eccentricity is I think traditionally a white dude and you know and I feel like Jodie Whittaker has been allowed to have a lot of fun playing that kind of whimsical role and you know but you know I feel like in general on television you can reach a narrower audience you have like you Mm -hmm, know a lot mm -hmm. of TV shows are now kind of like because there's like we're now at peak TV and there's like 5,000 TV (laughs) shows at any given time uh, any particular TV show if they could just get one audience and really kind of glom onto it then you know Mm -hmm. um it doesn't they don't need to worry about like appealing to every single demographic in the united states um (laughs) and you also have like more screen time you have like if you have like a 10 episode season or a 13 episode season you have like you know 10 hours to like really delve into the characters and you don't have to just like Mm -hmm. settle into like a really simplistic not simplistic but you don't have to decide as quickly is this character a problem or are they like somebody that we appreciate and like you can you could kind of play with both you could also just kind of understand the character a little bit better because you spend more time with them so it's a, just a different dynamic well and i think a thing that was really registering with me as i was watching auntie mame was how this character if this character can exist this this zany woman uh, she has to be a supporting character. Mm -hmm. Like, we can have her as, like, you know, I I don't know why, but I immediately thought of Gully, Rosie O'Donnell's Gully and Harriet the Spy. Oh, yeah. You can have the sort of whimsical god fairy godmother figure as long as she exists in the periphery to like show up and teach you a lesson right. and then go away and you leave with what she's imparted to you but having a a woman of a certain age right. and being this wacky eccentric figure that did feel exceptional while I was watching it like oh this is auntie mame's movie it's about this isn't about her. the little boy yeah this is about Auntie Mae. Screw that kid. She's the hero that kid of the is story. just there for like decoration. <laughs> he's just, you know, yeah. He's the one who's a problem who has to be solved, kind of. Yes. Yes, he's Auntie Mame's problem that has to be solved. Oh, the employment bureau didn't tell me you're bringing a child with you. Well, no matter. He looks like a nice little boy. And if he misbehaves, we can always toss him in the river. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I just like I said, I feel like, you know, it's partly ageism for sure. It's partly like, mm-hmm. you know, because again, you can be a 20 year old mm-hmm. eccentric woman, but then you're a manic pixie dream girl, probably. Then you're manic pixie dream girl. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's a mixture of ageism and, and misogyny. And it's just sort of like a whole bundle of mm-hmm. stuff that, you know, Hollywood has really gotten deeper into that since the 50s or since the early 70s when they mm-hmm. made the Lucille Ball version of, of, of MAME. I think it's just like now older, older women, especially, or older, Mm -hmm. Older people who are not cis men really are Mm -hmm. expected to either be supporting characters or 
to have like, mm-hmm. or to be kind of tragic in some way. Well, and, and, and uh, you know, talking about like when we started the conversation, you're talking about like those women who are, are just exist to shoot people mm-hmm. or, or who are just sort of hollowed out shells. You know, it's like that didn't feel aspirational to me. And I I was listening to some of the, uh, it's like some of the TED Talks you had given in preparation, mm-hmm. the paranoid optimist, and then the talk about being, daring to dream of the future, basically. And you talked a bit about um, when you were growing up, you weren't you you had a learning disability and at once were also a talented and gifted child. You you were kind of diagnosed as both and where you weren't necessarily thriving with schoolwork and, and writing your ABCs. You had this incredibly rich imaginative life like you you had talked about like I was you know, I had these whole adventures in my mind with my imaginary friends and I, and I wanted to hear from you about having kind of seizing upon aspirational figures younger perhaps seeing something like an anti-mame and having such like a bright creative life in your own mind and kind of making yourself the hero of your own story and like in imaginary contexts as you're growing up yeah i mean gosh so i was well i was what's now called dual exceptional which is basically like Mm. this thing of like you are both you know, allegedly gifted and talented and also learning disabled. And apparently that's a super common combination. There were actually my, my young adult book, Victory is Greater Than Death. There were some drafts of that book where I had the, the, my main character, Tina, be diagnosed mm-hmm. as like dual exceptional. And then it turns out that actually she's an alien. And that's why um, mm-hmm. she's got a, a, such a different way of thinking about stuff. And I definitely felt like an alien as a kid. And it ended up not, it, this ended up not fitting into my young adult book for a variety of reasons. But I feel like uh, it's a super common thing. It's, um, it can be really confusing and frustrating, though, especially when I was a kid. It was very confusing and frustrating. And like there was a time when I was in sixth grade, seventh grade, where I was literally shuttling back and forth between like remedial classes, where it was basically like, mm-hmm. you know, those of us who were like, behind the curve on our schoolwork and couldn't quite get Mm -hmm. up to speed on, you know, the basic schoolwork we were supposed to be doing between that and like these gifted and talented programs where they would like try to, you know, challenge us and awaken our, you know, whatever, our awaken our creativity. And it was like, it was always like this weird kind of yo-yo thing going on, this sort Mm -hmm. of being knocked back and forth between those two extremes of how we were treated um, so yeah. it's, it's, it's a little weird and I did kind of take refuge in escapism and, you know, Dr. Who was a big one for me. Like I was really into Dr. Who mm. as a kid and it's, it's kind of a lifelong passion of mine. Uh, also when I was a little kid, uh, my mom and I would watch the Mary Tyler Moore show in reruns and Mary Tyler Moore <laughs> was another character who I just absolutely identified with because she was so <laughs> neurotic and she's so kind of, mm-hmm. she's like, she's someone who actually handles her stuff like she handles her stuff really well she does her job she's she's not like in any way like problematic or incompetent or messed up she's (laughs) just extremely neurotic okay that does it i've got to say something i don't don't know what i'm going to say but i gotta say something which i kind of especially Mm -hmm. as adults i can really identify with but even as a kid i was like (laughs) this is this is me i am this person like the Mary Tyler Moore show, <laughs> like was like a character was was a, was a show that really made me like feel seen, and also this was one of the things where I was like, I want to be this person when I grow up. But actually, uh, I mm-hmm. feel like a spiritual descent into the Mary Tyler Moore show is Parks and Recreation, and the character of Leslie mm, Nope. Yeah, I hear you. And Leslie Nope mm-hmm. again. Leslie Nope isn't a larger than life eccentric. But she is kind of a weirdo. I am throwing a farewell party for my best friend, Ann Perkins. And if she casually mentioned three years ago that she thought indoor fireworks would be cool, then guess what? You're going to give me indoor fireworks. And she's somebody who does extremely silly, bonkers things, but we're never supposed to feel sorry for her or think that she needs to be fixed. And she's out Uh there doing good and making a difference in the world and being kind of a weirdo and like, you know, having a big heart and like, that's kind of what the show rests on in a way. I that I I'm I'm really glad you mentioned the having a big heart aspect of it because I think too like the the second character that you the second film character that you mentioned was Harley Quinn. The, you know, DCEU imagining of Harley Quinn, one of my absolute favorite characters of all time in anything. And 
I think to me, there's a real uniting factor between you mentioning like Les- Leslie Nope, Auntie Mame, and Harley Quinn <laughs> are all three women, <laughs> are all three women who are extroverts, who love what they love so loudly and unselfconsciously. And sometimes that puts them at odds with the order around them mm-hmm. and and they're they're kind of weird they're kind of like people look askance at mm-hmm. them and like what the fuck's your deal but they are they are all such sincere women at their core mm-hmm. if they're Hosting a party in 1958 or trying to, like, make the city of Pawnee the best it possibly could be or causing absolute mayhem and trying to find friends in Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. And I really liked that as, like, a thread that I that as soon as you said Leslie Nope, I was like, that gets to exactly what I had been thinking about both Auntie Mame and Harley. Yeah. That, That heart beating loudly outward. And that's kind of what I loved about what I have loved about Jodie Whittaker's version of the Doctor in Doctor Who. I feel like her mm-hmm. first season, they really played that up. Her like her big heartedness, her extroversion, her like, I'm going to just mm. bring all my friends together and throw a wacky party. Yeah. We are going to take a quick break, but we will be back with more from Charlie Jane Anders. Hi, I'm Janet Varney. And just like you, I survived high school. And we're not alone. On my podcast, The JV Club, I invite some of my friends to share the highs and lows of their teen years. Like moments with Aisha Tyler. But when you're a kid, the stakes are just pretty low. Go to school, try not to get in trouble, get laid. Jamila Jamil. I watched television probably every waking hour during that time when I was shit-faced on medicine. And Dave Holmes. We talked and talked, and then everybody left. It was just us two, and I was like, I love you. Learn how you two can be a functioning adult after the drama and heartbreak of high school. Every week on the JV Club with Janet Varney. Find it on Maximum Fun. Or wherever you get your podcasts. This is a judgment-free show. We have wasted this world. Our magic put a storm in the sky that has rendered the surface of our planet uninhabitable. But beneath the surface, well, that's another story entirely. In a city built leagues below the apocalypse, survivors of the storm forge paths through a strange new world. Some seek salvation for their homeland above. Others seek to chart the vast undersea expanse outside the city's walls. And others still seek, what else? Fortune and glory. Dive into the Ether Sea, the latest campaign from the Adventure Zone, every other Thursday on MaximumFun.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome back to Feeling Seen. I'm your host, Jordan Cruciola, and I'm talking with the author, the journalist, the hostess, the podcaster, the prankster, and all around bon vivant, Charlie Jane Anders. We're picking up right where we left off with the character of Harley Quinn. I love Harley Quinn, too. I've loved her pretty much since she, like, debuted on Batman the Animated Series and, like, Mm -hmm. you know... When Paul Dini was was in San Francisco promoting his his graphic novel um, several years ago, I, I got to go see him, and he was. It was really great to listen to him talk about Harley Quinn because he was one of the creators of the character originally, and he definitely kind of saw her as this sort of vaudeville character, kind of like there was mm-hmm. some Jewish comedian of like the stage who he based her on a little bit, and I forget. I think he even had her voice, the character originally in the animated show. I, I'd have to go back and look this up. Somebody, uh, the producer just posted it here that Arlene, Arlene Sorkin was the original voice of Harley Quinn. And I think Arlene Sorkin was this kind of stage comedian that Paul Dini based her on. Mm. But I I love that kind of vaudeville thing. And it does kind of get back to Auntie Mame because of like, she start, yeah. Auntie Mame started out as a stage character as well. And like this kind mm-hmm. of thing of like the kind of loud, obnoxious, kind of silly woman who we just, appreciate her is like a thing Mm -hmm. of like that era i want to say and that's i feel like that's where harley quinn's roots are she's a very kind of like Mm -hmm. she's a loud broad you know she even describes herself as a broad at at the start of her movie her the birds of prey movie we all know the saying behind every successful man there's a badass broad 
Well, that was me. Yeah, I mean, I think Margot Robbie really does just bring so much vitality and like joy and and just like brazenness to the role of Harley Quinn. She really just like owns it. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, there's so many ways that they could have gone wrong with a live action Harley Quinn. And David Ayer's Suicide Squad did some of them. Some of them. But again, Margot Robbie just like shines through. I think that she's she's really like if you watch all three of the movies where she's playing Harley Quinn, it's a consistent character. And that's, I think, Mm -hmm. largely down to I mean, I think definitely in the second Suicide Squad movie, James Gunn clearly had been paying some attention Mm -hmm. to Birds of Prey and sort of cribbed a little bit from what they did with the character because it has that Mm -hmm. same kind of like fantasy feeling and that same kind of cartooniness that is like Mm -hmm. so delightful but yeah i feel like margot robbie is to deserves a lot of credit for the character feeling so consistent across all of her live action appearances the the way that that movie the the birds of prey movie pivots from like i got dumped by my like evil abusive boyfriend and i'm a wreck because of that to really i'm upset because this i had this beautiful sandwich and it was destroyed what a way to start my new life <sighs> with the perfect egg sandwich my hands just mm. <laughs> it's actually i rewatched a little bit of it last night i didn't have time to rewatch the whole thing i watched like the first 20 minutes and i was like you know that's actually i hadn't fully appreciated the first time how how smoothly done that is mm-hmm. i thought at the time when i first watched that birds of prey movie that it had it had a big challenge in that it's kind of about her moving on from her relationship with the Joker, but the Joker is not mm-hmm. allowed to be a character in it, I guess because they couldn't get Jared to come back and play the character again, or they just didn't want Jared to come back and play the character again. <laughs> yeah, and one of, those. one of those. And so it's, there's this character who's talked about a lot, but we never actually see him except as like a little cartoon at one point. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's always weird when there's a character who is important to the story, but is not allowed to actually be seen in the story. It's sort of like Mm -hmm. the first season of the Supergirl TV show where she constantly talks about her cousin Superman and he is just like, we occasionally see his (laughs) legs and then we don't see the rest of him. And it's like, (laughs) those are his legs. Okay, bye. You know, they kind of (laughs) finesse that by like having this weird pivot towards the sandwich being the object of her, her despondency, which I think is like kind of brilliant in a weird way. If you can't actually have the guy she broke up with. I mean, I, I love the Harley Quinn animated series. I don't know if you've watched that. Yeah. It does have some yes. issues. There's Kaylee Kuoko is also doing a tremendous job she with is. Harley as that voice. Um, you know, it has some issues with, there's a couple of characters who kind of verge on, well, who are do embody anti-Semitic stereotypes and it's been brought up as an issue. Mm. So that's a thing mm-hmm. that, that always makes me a little hesitant to recommend that show wholeheartedly. But the way that the mm-hmm. character of Harley Quinn is handled is just, amazing and her breakup with the joker is is just actually handled beautifully in that show uh because mm-hmm. the joker is a character and he's around and she does we do get to see her kind of like really realize deep down that she's better off without him and finally kind of get kind of get perspective on him in a way well and, and it and you have it within the within the the cartoon you have a character who is like clearly demonstrably queer and then in the in the live action movies in in harley's first solo movie i hope we get more it feels like this is just like a bisexual carnival like we understand that harley has margot's harley has a girlfriend in her past and as far as i'm concerned auntie mame is a queer figure like she is of this queer subculture she is a queer sort of she's sort of a queer in that that queer icon status way where she becomes like an an honorary very celebrated like deity of the community and i like that and even in even in leslie nope too like she is very much you know a a heterosexual woman in her romantic pursuits but at the same time the obsession that she has with Anne, Mm -hmm. her best best friend in the world it's a real wonderful, beautiful presentation of the way that you can have multiple kinds of soulmates in this world mm-hmm. and that your romantic relationship doesn't have to exist paramount to like this 
love story you have with a best friend in your life, they can they can sit as tantamount to one another. And so I feel, and maybe that's just, this is just my queer bias in everything, I feel like a connective tissue of queerness between all these women as well, living these queer, non-normative lifestyles. Yeah, I mean, I think that's 100% true. And I think living kind of an unapologetic life, living kind of a, a big, you know, obnoxious life is sort of inherently mm-hmm. queer. And I think that, you know, having Agreed. having rich relationships that, you know, like you said, having rich relationships that include really passionate friendships that include like mm-hmm. a relationship with your whole community of, you know, outcasts and oddballs feels like it's going to be queer on some level, no matter what, especially mm-hmm. if you are welcoming in everybody who's not welcome ever, anywhere else. And, you know, that's going to be a lot of queer people. So, yeah, I, I am sure that Auntie Mame on some level was always kind of like canonically not super <laughs> straight. Like she just feels yeah. like that. She feels, you know, she's one of those people who I think is kind of an inspiration to a lot of drag performers and a lot of like, you know. Mm. So I, I'm totally there with you on that for sure. Well, and I, I, a thing I wondered about when you were when you were assessing which which characters you wanted, and you mentioned Auntie Mame, and you said Harley Quinn. You talked about how you you always like the misfit characters, but you also like the tricksters and pranksters, yeah. which is obviously the epitome of Harley Quinn, and feels very Auntie Mame. Yeah, I am. I've always been drawn to those sorts of characters and those sorts of like the idea of like pranks <laughs> and like subversion and like mm-hmm. small acts of sabotage are something that I feel very like connected to. <laughs> You know, when I first <laughs> moved here to San Francisco back in like 1999, gosh, kind of a while ago, 23 years, man. Wow. When I first moved to the Bay Area, I immediately like started getting connected with like local stuff. And one of the local groups that I pretty much instantly fell into was the Cacophony Society, which was kind of this group of like pranksters who did weird, like subversive events and like but i just i've always loved that kind of thing and i've always loved like we were i was had this long conversation about this the other day with some folks about like culture jamming and like you know the yes man and all this just like basically how i think we need a lot more of that right now because when you have Uh kind of not to bring down the mood but when you have like fascism and kind of authoritarianism on the rise you you kind of need a lot of um culture jamming and kind of playful subversion in order to to, uh-huh. to to be able to push back because, you know, simply having these arguments in a, a serious way is, is not going to get you anywhere when you're dealing with people who are going to keep changing their story and moving the goalposts and have they, yeah. Anyway, I think we all need to be hatching schemes to basically <laughs> cover ourselves in fake fur and get out there like day glow pink fake fur and like, get in the way of these yahoos, these these people when they try to assert that there's only one valid way of looking at the world and it's theirs. To bring it back to my my young adult novel, uh Victory's Greater Than Death. Yeah. Like I ended up not having the main character be learning disabled for various reasons, but I did end up having her like I decided as I was revising that she was gonna be part of a prankster group called the Lasagna Hats, which was the the <laughs> completely most nonsensical name I could think of. And they go around doing like low key, like small pranks and acts of, you know, kind of disruption in the face of, of jerks. And they like dress up in like Mm -hmm. pink plushy dinosaur costumes and confront abusive landlords. And like when there's this guy who comes to give a talk about how basically like, women are inferior and girls shouldn't learn to read and women, you know, women shouldn't have the vote uh-huh. or whatever. And he's basically like that guy. I mean, you'll, you'll find that guy on the internet. He's pretty, he's everywhere right now. And like, <laughs> he's everywhere. And so when they, they basically like set up out across the street for where this guy is coming to speak and they just have like a disco party and put on like their most ridiculous disco outfits and play disco music and dance around. And that's their way. Of, and they have signs and stuff, but they mostly are just like, yeah, we're, we're here and you can't ignore us. And mm-hmm, so that mm-hmm. was like that. Was, I decided that's who this character was because that's always the person I root for is the person who's going to like do some pranks. <laughs> well, in it, in it, like in listening to your talks about like being at once paranoid about like what we have wrought in terms of the coming future, but also being an eternal optimist in your own way about the possible of the future. I think 
like you writing like that and you you bringing characters like this and and talking about talking about the future in that way it seems to center joy yeah and for queer for queer folks just centering the joy of their lives it is it feels it's still even as in the last 15 minutes of film and television, things have gotten better in terms of like representation. It feels like centering that joy is still a kind of like radical act of taking up space. It really is. And I feel like a lot of my favorite, you know, TV and to some extent movies of the last several years is about kind of like taking up space and being exuberant and joyful. And like, I think of the show Pose where there's some really heavy stuff Mm -hmm. in that show, but it's also about dancing and, and having these beautiful ballrooms and these amazing costumes and like putting on these elaborate, unbelievable performances. And like, I feel like the show pose has meant like more than I could possibly say to me in the last several years. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, it's so funny. I was talking to my partner, Anna Lee about like, who should I pick? Who should I pick? Going back and forth about like who. Annalie, who you do the the podcast with the best title ever, Our Opinions Are Correct. Yeah. With Charlie Jane Anders and Annalie knew it. We went back and forth for a while. We had a long conversation about this. And one movie that came up was Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, which is a mm. movie I, I also have not seen in a very long time. I definitely have not seen it in the last 20 years, but Mm -hmm. I do remember Priscilla queen of the desert being a very like beautifully exuberantly queer, joyful film about Mm -hmm. these drag performers who get on a bus across Australia and kind of have this like larger than life adventure in the outback kind of. Mm -hmm. And I just, that movie made a huge impression on me and I still listen to the soundtrack all the time. (laughs) <laughs> uh, so that's another one that I sort of thought about that kind of fits into that theme of like queer joy and larger than life uh, colorfulness. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you, I, I guess my my final question t- would be uh, thinking about the extravagance of figures like Harley and Auntie Mame and, and, and even Priscilla Queen of the Desert. Are, have you brought to your own life your sufficient amount of Auntie Mame and Harley Quinn? Or do you feel like you are still in the pursuit of building your ideal sort of coterie and and party of sort of tricksters, pranksters, eccentrics, extravagance around you? Like, where are you in your journey to becoming Auntie Mame, Charlie Jane? I mean, wow, that's such a difficult question i definitely (laughs) feel really good about the last like 20 something years of me being in san francisco and getting to be i don't feel like i've been at the center of anything but i feel like i've gotten to be part of some amazing scenes Mm -hmm. of like queer performers and you know activists and sex positive people and just like performance artists kind of and Mm -hmm. you know i've gotten to know a lot of very colorful weird interesting people who have really kind of brought in my perspective in different ways so i feel like i i always say that like i define success largely in terms of like who are the people around me mm. if i'm like have people that i think are awesome around me then i think i'm a successful person and i do mm-hmm. feel like obviously it's hard because the last like couple of years have really cut me off from everybody like yeah. like as with so many of us so there are people who i'm like well they're part of my social circle i haven't actually seen them yeah. since 2019 mm-hmm. but they're still my people and like but i feel like those things will those things will survive and endure and re- restore themselves because we're we're gonna we're gonna make them we're gonna we're gonna bring them back no matter what uh, so I do feel really good about getting to be part of somebody just beautiful, weird scenes. Well, I, 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 when I was, one should never read the comments. We all know that. But I, my eyes did travel down to a comment on one of the YouTube videos that was posted of one of your TED Talks. And I thought I would share with you the top comment on one of your videos, which says, I need to know her. Everything about her speaks to me in ways I never imagined someone else getting. Oh, my God. I thought that was a really, really nice thing to hear uh, for for somebody so, so drawn out by by the misfits and the pranksters and the one who writes the misfits and the pranksters of their own now. Oh, I'm going to I'm seriously going to cry. I'm actually kind of crying a little bit. That's like so beautiful. Thank you. Oh my God. 
<laughs> You're hosting your own party, Charlie Jane, Auntie Charlie Jane. Uh, well, is there is there any uh, last word you would like to give about about books you want people to buy, things that they should be running out and looking for right now? Yeah, I mean, Victory's Greater Than Death is out in paperback now. It is a mm-hmm. completely silly, you know, madcap kind of you know, space adventure that is super heavily influenced by my early love of Doctor Who and like also things like Guardians of the Galaxy and Steven Universe. And if you mm-hmm. like like really kind of zany adventures full of people who are there for each other and who, you know, respect each other's pronouns and ask before hugging, <laughs> I think that you will appreciate this book. It's very much about chosen family and about finding your people. And the sequel is out April 5th, and that's called Dreams Bigger Than Heartbreak. And it would mean a lot to me if y'all picked them up. I'm basically done writing the third book. I'm just revising it now. And this, this, the series just gets sillier and more ridiculous as it goes along. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad that the sort of extravagance of your imagination uh, has this has this forum to pour everything onto the page. Thank you so much for joining us and for your time today, Charlie Jane. I truly appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Charlie Jane and her beautiful mind as much as I did. We will put the link to her Twitter profile in our show notes. And do not skip out on her book, Dreams Bigger Than Heartbreak. She's a great follow on the internet, and you can keep up with her many creative ventures. Uh, So please do that. It's that time again. Time again for one quick thing before I go. And apparently I just cannot avoid walking into a bee's nest because I would like to discuss something that I've talked a bit about online up to this point and I I, I talked a bit about as well um, in a conversation I think was great on, on Pop Culture Happy Hour. That was a really good panel discussion on the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie and I think a good conversation about this movie is important to seek out because of how much toxic ass trash there was floating around the release of the new Texas Chainsaw movie, which debuted on Netflix. And I don't know, fucking, should I explain it to you? It's it's a Texas Chainsaw movie. A bunch of young people go to a place in Texas where nobody invited them and they're really presumptuous. And then a lot of bad stuff starts happening to them at the hands of a chainsaw wielding Leatherface. This time around, it invokes, you know, social issues that I, I don't know that the movie is super equipped to handle. Like, okay, we're in... Gen- gentrification and and race in gentrification and i get like okay we're gonna bring a school shooting into this backstory like there are a lot of heavy topics that are introduced in this movie that you know what your mileage may vary on what how you think this movie handled the topics at hand i'm not here to tell you to like the new texas chainsaw massacre movie i i think it's a stunning speeding train that goes straight into like a 10 inch thick steel wall and explodes in rather glorious fashion. I had a very fun time watching it, but it's not really, it's not my concern whether or not you like the movie. My concern here is that it just seemed to demonstrate upon its arrival an absolutely insane, either unwillingness or inability to just watch a fucking movie and (laughs) feel a way about it based on its merits or not. When it's attached to, you know, a vaunted legacy property. Obviously, this happens a lot in horror. The sequel machine is particularly robust in the horror space. So what you have in the new Texas Chainsaw is the ninth installment in a franchise. And it is absolutely staggering to me to watch people react to the ninth installment in a franchise and critique it based on whether or not it made them feel or it invoked the feelings that the original did. The original was made in 1974, you guys. 1974 was a different world. It was a different time. We talked about things differently. We felt differently. Like, yes, we have uh, in the way that the 1970s was a time of great social turmoil in the United States, so too is our present moment one of great social turmoil in the United States. There are parallels, absolutely. But the expectation that a movie should 
invoke the same feelings as a predecessor from half a century ago feels absolutely absurd. Like, in a way that... I hope we've progressed. I hope we've gone other places. I hope we have... Dis- I hope we've learned to talk about movies in a different way. I hope we're different people in some ways than we were in 1974. Or hell, if it's Nightmare on Elm Street, then we were in 1984. Or with Scream, the way we the way we felt in 1996. I don't know why any part of the conversation about a legacy sequel so many years removed from an original is so often just connected to this like trailer with flat tires slowing us all the way down going up a hill why we must constantly evaluate new entries regardless again of how you feel like they're executed in their own autonomous single movie existence i am not seeking to recapture the spirit of something that happened a century ago a half a goddamn century ago i am more interested in what we can do now that is new, that is interesting, that stands on the shoulders of giants that came before us to do something that feels present and urgent and relevant to now, to how we consider movies now, how we make them, how we think about them, how we appreciate them, how we evaluate them, all of that. And so, yeah, just, you know, to me, one of the greatest remakes of all time, of all time, of any genre, is the Evil Dead remake. And that movie invokes almost absolutely nothing of the silliness of Sam Raimi's original first two Evil Dead movies particularly. Because I think when people talk about Evil Dead, they are talking about the second one, but they're acting like they're talking about the first one. But like, that movie was incredible because it, you look at that, that is a movie of the 2000s and early 2010s. That savageness, that brutality, that cruelty that just bludgeons you over the head the entire time. It's not silly. It's not camp. Like the original. Like, that is an incredible remake. And in Scream 5, a movie that I sincerely, thoroughly enjoyed, my biggest issues with the movie come when it is most aggressively, ham-fistedly trying to evoke Scream 1. The times when that movie is the most clunky are the times when it's like, hey guys, did you know this is a Scream movie? Like, no, but it sings when it stands on its own and brings us these new characters and lets them bloom in front of us in their full 2022 glory. So yeah, let's just like get our shit together. Stop acting like it needs to feel like something that was made when your fucking parents were children. I mean, come on. Let's come into the present. Let's, if you're not going to give Texas Chainsaw Massacre a break on its merits, at least give it a break on the fact that it's not the legendary fucking genre busting horror revolution creating a new way of considering the genre that the 1974 original was like sorry toby hooper is coming gone the movie he's a legend movie's a legend now let's just do something new let's do something different but anyway this is my show so that's my soapbox that i get to stand on and that's our show there it is that's our show you can follow us on Twitter at Feeling Scene Pod or join our Facebook group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash Feeling Scene Pod. And you can also send us an email at Feeling Scene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, buyer beware, I'm Jor Crew on Twitter at J O R C R U. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. The show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. <laughs> MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture Artist owned Audience supported